Hi guys, welcome back to the Carlos Digital Show. Been back since quite some time now. It's been uh, quite a few months dealing with some personal things and catching up with life in general. So I've decided to return. There's a lot of things to talk about, uh, in particular to what's happening to Warner Brothers Discovery and the films that have been released and uh, what's coming in the future. Um, Let's talk first about the Ezra Miller situation. Um, Ezra Miller, as you know, has been in the news for some time now. He's having some, what appear to be some personal issues um, that may require, you know, I don't want to talk uh, without full knowledge, but uh, it's a lot of uh, activity basically in his personal life that uh, has put him in the public eye in terms of his behavior in Hawaii and other places. Uh, I don't want to talk about that too much uh, without having full information. Uh, all I know is that if you were to need any help or anything of that nature, there is uh, no shame in basically asking for help. So I hope he gets all the help that he needs and he requires to get better and to, you know, be uh, continue to be a successful person. So I wish him all the best. Uh, where I want to take the discussion is in the way that uh, the studio has handled this situation. Uh, there has been a report from uh, Rolling Stone magazine in which they detail uh, Ezra Miller's behavior as one of um, being erratic, being concerning, and they particularly use the word of uh, having meltdowns. So um, this article comes out uh, not during the filming of The Flash not at the point in time where these things were happening, not during a filming period, which was, I think was about nine months. And it comes out of nowhere saying that, you know, Warner Brothers is having a meeting where everything has been paused uh, in regards to uh, Ezra Miller and that Ezra has been having meltdowns in the filming uh, of uh, The Flash, which is kind of interesting because while reading this article, you know, it gives you an impression of a lack of clarity and lack of actual journalism to get to the bottom of what's being reported. Number one, this is an article that's been reported by an unknown source that apparently um, went to Rolling Stone to commission this article because there's no other way that this would have happened. You know, somebody from WB went to report something about Ezra Miller in regards to the Flash. So to me it's convenient because number one, uh, why well, is this reported now that Ezra has some legal troubles? Not before. Uh, why is it that the way that Ezra is being described uh, is done without any actual real proof or context? The only quotes that exist is uh, for his meltdown is something that says, I don't know what I'm doing. As you know, a meltdown can be subjectively defined by many different people in different ways, but uh, when you talk about a meltdown, you're talking about a mental breakdown, whether it's it's emotional or logical. You, If you're going to use those words to describe a person, the person's behavior, you should really give some, some proof as to what that actually means instead of using a sort of generic term. The very next thing that says in quotes, it says that he said, I don't know what I'm doing, and there is no context to that. You know, no context as to in under what conditions he was saying this, uh, why he was saying it. There's just it's just a quote. So by providing that quote, they're saying this is something that he said, but it's being framed in a very devious way that it doesn't. It's not justifiable. And if you're gonna basically try to frame a person that way, you should really basically try to explain what that means. So to me, it's kind of suspicious. You know, very difficult to to assess because there isn't really anything to it, uh, except that, you know, you're trying to link Ezra Miller's behavior with what's happening in the news headlines. So you're, you're linking his behavior with the Flash film. Uh, as you know, the Flash is a film that is almost a guarantee to fail. There is no there is no shortage of bad things going for this film. Number one being a total Spider-Man No Way Home copycat with the multiple flashes in multiple universes and timelines, uh, or whatever you may want to call them. 
Uh, in addition, you're bringing up, you know, people like Michael Keaton into the fold. You are um, creating a movie that is sort of a hate letter to the fans of the current universe because you're planning on rehashing or sorry, re rewriting history in a way that, you know, you could basically take the universe and you know, cut off the storyline that has been you know, put together so far. Uh, you have Ben Affleck potentially being used as a pawn for this movie. And in addition, you have something really bad, which was the firing of Ray Fisher. So it's very likely that they know this project has a uh, very little chance of succeeding, uh, especially after the box office returns of the Batman. Uh, with all the uh, support from the studio, with all the marketing uh, prowess and investment that the studio was able to put in, this movie is struggling to make you know, $750,000 million. So it's very likely that The Flash is not going to be able to do that in this, in this market. So it seems to me that someone is trying to link um, Ezra's current problems to a potential failure of the film. The idea is to link Ezra's behavior to the filming of the film uh, or to the edit, uh, to the progress of the film, let's call it that way. So very concerning, not very happy about it um, because this is not something new, attacking actors uh, from the studio with falls also it's, it's, it's a thing. Now we have the very next day, 48 hours or 24 hours later, an article from IGN saying that a source in WB reached out to them. It told them that a there is no there was no meeting in which uh, Ezra's projects were put put on hold, and that uh, none of the things that that article saying were actually true. So to me, it's very very convenient uh, to put out a statement that does damage to the public image of a person, and then turn back the next day. I was already suspicious in using the words I. I don't know what I'm doing as a you know, sort of generic proof of some sort of meltdown and then to backtrack the next day. To me, it seems that this was someone that wanted to do some damage and take advantage of the opportunity uh, of Ezra being in the news and putting something out there that would damage his image and that would uh, attack the current DCEU, but at the same time not want to get sued for it. You can, you can clearly see in the quotes that it's, it's very generic very uh, misleading and then the very next day you know it, it's cancelled but the news of him you know having some sort of behavioral issue it is out there so damage is done so to me it's obvious that this is the same group of people that is doing the exact same thing they've always been doing you know it's, it's a group of people that is clearly from the studio for these outlets to just believe what they're saying straight up and that they have uh, the attention of multiple outlets to be able to pull this move so this is nothing new. We have seen this before in which somebody at Warner Media uh, has some sort of issue with the uh, Snyderverse and has gone attacking multiple people. They've done it with Ben Affleck and his struggles for alcoholism. They have used their PR to create falsehoods, which they have admitted to uh, uh, to Ray Fisher. Um, this is, you know, if you guys remember, you know, there was the Wall Street or uh, Wall Street Journal article by Ben Fritz in which uh, someone, and I quote, says, what is this uh, alternate version of Justice League that does not exist? Well, it did exist. So we know that there's somebody very insecure about the attention that, you know, the Snyderverse and the fans online get that has to go to the trades to attack the actors and just to say this, this has to end, this is over. So it's pretty obvious who what, who that camp is, uh, is basically very easy to see that it's the group of managers that uh, want to move in their own direction and they can't seem to understand, you know, or accept what the crowd wants and what people want to see. Uh, so it's, um, it's, it's very obvious that this is the brass that has sort of survived the announcements of the merger uh, and moving forward, they feel they may be on on trial you know they're going to be judged by their performance and some of these people their contract will be up sometime next year so they there were delays to the flash movie but the flash is a stamp on, on their work and they may want to be calling the track so it's it's very concerning to see this i think a lot of people are tired of uh, having to deal with this kind of situation in which uh, you have a studio in the you know the pr and the commercial reach that is at the hands of some really shady people that are, you know, using 
uh, misdirection to attack people. It just happens to be, you know, starting five years ago, you start having all these news articles just trying to paint things badly, and we know that they lie, and we know that, you know, there were lies in the article where they were saying that, you know, Zack Snyder was passing the baton to Joss Whedon, when that is not what was happening at all. Like, he never selected him, he never passed the baton, you know, that's, we know now that that was never the truth, and it's on record, you know, some of these people, they, they lie. So we've seen this behavior of, you know, multiple uh, outlets being used to portray, you know, the, the people involved in these projects and even the fans in a certain way. So to me, that's completely unacceptable, but it's, it's clear that for about five, six years, this has been a common trend and, you know, we, I hope this ends with discovery, but um, I guess we'll have to see, but it's very disappointing to see uh, the studio behaving this way and why I think um, that this is uh, bias at this moment, this Ezra Miller situation, is you just have to keep reading the article and towards the end of the article for some reason. The Rolling Stone article mentions Will Smith, who has absolutely nothing to do with this article. It's a completely separate situation, but they mentioned that Will Smith priced himself out of uh, Deadshot, that there was a Deadshot solo movie in development and that he has now, you know, uh, priced himself out of the film. So to me, that's you know, very clear to bring those two things up. You know, it's those two situations up in articles that don't really have are related. It's because whomever from Warner Brothers went to Rolling Stone has some sort of insecurity with the Snyderverse continuing. So all they're doing is trying to take advantage of whatever problem the actors in this universe are going through to make a stance and try to basically sink it. So, you know, I hope this ends. This is, you know, very tiring and very, you know, it's unacceptable from a studio to be behaving this way. It shows lack of order, leadership, and you know common sense. It's just saying, you know, low morals and values, which we know it's part of the way that they do business. So I hope this ends with discovery sometime soon. But uh, you know, we don't have to stand for it. We don't have to accept it. So I hope uh, you guys understand that you know your time to make noise continues on and to make yourself help. The Oscars were a strong statement that says the fans are strong, they're united, and they can make noise, and they can help you promote your films. That part is there, and that must have intimidated, you know, people that were in the crowd in regards to what we can do. So keep it up, guys, and let's see, let's see what the future brings. Let's hope Discovery smartens up to this whole thing. So now let's discuss the Warner Media merger, uh, everything that's been happening lately in terms of uh, AT&T finally saying goodbye and the Warner Bros. Discovery merger finally coming into uh, fruition. Uh, as you have seen, some of the key or the top uh, generals in the old structure, such as CEO Jason Kilar and WB CEO and Sarnoff have been removed and we are continuing in a path of uh, restructuring. Um, all our other executives in other parts of Warner Media were also let go or were uh, given the opportunity to uh, quit their jobs and exit gracefully, which is you know very typical of these uh, high-end uh, corporate environments. Um, but essentially, um, this is just the beginning, I feel. You know, a lot of people were disappointed to not have seen someone like Toby Emmerich be completely removed, um, given that you know we don't have to go into extreme detail, but considering the fact that he has been an absolutely horrible uh, manager, quite possibly the worst in Hollywood, uh, and for him to stay once again in his position after all these changes over the last couple of years is, is certainly concerning, but um, I also think that uh, this is not the, the end. That uh, right now we're starting to find out that only until now, when things are basically closing down and some decisions are able to be made, is when the upper managers are taking over the what was uh, Warner Media and is now Warner Bros. Dis Warner Bros. Discovery are going to start looking into what each 
a subsection of the company uh, does in what market it's involved in and what are the relevant factors to make this work. So it's a lot of evaluation here that's still yet to happen. Um, I want to say two things about uh, Jason Kilar and, and Sarnoff. Uh, while these guys joined in after the AT&T merger uh, and they were seen as people who were bringing a sea of change, I only saw a group of people that brought perhaps more chaos by the lack of action. Um, I saw Jason Kilar as a person that was, you know, very concerned with public image through social media, sharing his thoughts and his um, excitement to be a leader of a company that has such a epic and, you know, historical footprint in the industry. That part is appreciated, of course, but um, the day and date strategy is basically what he will forever be defined as a uh, bold move in a time where the Hollywood as an industry was suffering and was on life support essentially, as some articles put it, but uh, he tried to basically create a shift that ultimately burned the image of the company in the eyes of many other people. Um, so unfortunately, that did not bode well for him. There was also some last minute fiasco uh, at uh, CNN, but it wasn't meant to be and Jason did not turn out to be that good of a CEO. In addition, you have Anne Sarnoff, uh, an executive that unfortunately, I must say, did not end up looking as anything other than a lame duck CEO. This was a person that was brought in without any film background. He was, she was there to be more of a, you know, execution, uh, partnership creating type of business development uh, type of CEO. Um, and ultimately, she was left to be a proxy for Toby Emmerich. And why do I say this? because most of the actions that we saw her take place in and the face that she was starting to you know, show towards maybe last year of her tenure as uh, CEO of the company was one where she was trying to uh, A, show herself and her practicalness in the company, which was didn't do anything for, him, for her image. But in addition, she did do some things that were clearly uh, Emmerich uh, influenced. So she let herself be influenced by Toby Emmerich uh, in particular, there was, and this is something that will forever define her time as a CEO, in my mind, is the fact that she went and had an article commissioned, uh, sort of fall interview in which she was answering prepared questions uh, right on the release of the Snyder Cut uh, weekend. Uh, when you have this major project coming out and you have the CEO of that division, uh, having an article out there saying two things. One, the fans are toxic, that the fans were attacking the executives, that she was not going to allow that, and that uh, the Snyder Cut, they were happy to be able to allow Zack Snyder to quote unquote finish his trilogy uh, and, you know, to protect Walter Hamada as a person of color. So this is a person that did not show any type of you know, intelligence. Uh, I've never seen in my career uh, CEO of such a big corporation act this way. To me, she basically was acting on behalf of Toby Emmerich to uh, go against the interests of the market. So that's, uh, you know, one of the big mistakes I feel that they have made and that they're suffering for now from the DC perspective, which is to try to sabotage your own product and to trash talk your own product. And that has been something very common since the arrival of Tom Emmerich and, and with Jeff Johns in the company and has carried on through the past five years with, you know, with your fake PR announcements, which I talked earlier in the show, uh, the, you know, the frosty situation and all these, you know, nasty things that keep happening on the public domain when we're talking about uh, DC. Uh, so that was a big mistake. I never, I lost my respect for her essentially after that. I don't think that should have been done, you know, self victimizing just because you want to resist a path that will clearly lead to success is, is uh, wrong. They took this very personal as, you know, whatever we do and whatever we decide to do is what you as a consumer are going to like and it's what you will take and end of story. That's a big mistake. They did not study the market. They did not study the demand that the customers had for it. So that was a uh, rather huge mistake on their behalf that they're paying for even today. So not, I'm not going to say I'm not uh, 
not happy about their dismissal. I did not think they did anything to change the culture of the company. The same uh, racial and discrimination problems the company had inside were not addressed by them, uh, other than you know some you know puff piece messaging to the company. But they acknowledged themselves that there was racial discrimination within the company, and I feel they didn't really didn't do anything. As a matter of fact, they just allowed the attack of. Uh, of, of Warner Brother pictures on Ray Fisher to continue on and they try to dismiss him in some way. So uh, I don't feel bad for people who are wealthy uh, to get this kind of uh, end result. Uh, I hope that the merger you know, brings on about positive change to the company. I think we, as, as followers of, of Warner Brothers, we're frustrated with the way things have been handled, especially their messaging, the way that they have left the DC brand uh, today is is uh, the one of completely hypeless and a deflated uh, you know ecosystem in which nobody is really that excited about what's coming and you can see them playing favorites and just forcing things through you know Wonder Woman 80, uh, 1984 the Suicide Squad the Batman this is all just forced stuff that is just trying to swim against the current that is the consumer demand so. Obviously, the, the Oscars made a point. Uh, hopefully, Discovery wakes up and you know tries to correct all these things. There are rumors that there is indeed somebody is going to come in on the on the film division, potentially replacing Toby Emmerich. Uh, the name Emma Watts has been put out there. Emma left Paramount for no reason in November, uh, so we'll see if this is a person that's been targeted to take over. I think it is the right decision to replace Toby Emmerich. Uh, Toby Emmerich represents. Um, a little bit of the old guard and the old image the company desperately needs to change if they want to engage with um, with talent and to regain sort of the trust of uh, people in, in the market and the industry. Um, it, it's, it's obvious that they have a, a long road ahead. There is a lot of things that they have to fix and they have to change, but you know we shouldn't be too concerned because maybe over time things will change for the positive uh, just because a guy like Toby Emmerich remains the company. Uh, today does not mean that he will be there in a year. Uh, his contract was uh, Walter Hamada's expired in the span of, I believe, six to eight months or something like that. So it's possible that they're just basically are going to be uh, expired. Now, keep in mind that the delay of the films probably has something to do with all of this. Uh, if there's something that had happened in the past, and you saw it before the AT&T merger came in, was WB trying to force through the Justice League film and when this merger uh, was starting to take place and they basically fast-tracked uh, the, the Batman. Uh, so there is a trend here to try to establish things before a new management team can come in and, and, and set their path. So my opinion is that the finances, uh, especially Warner Brothers Pictures, are very, uh, I guess, in a bad shape. Might, the, the, the accounting ledgers must be disastrous. Uh, and, you know, to be fair and honest, all the films that were delayed were not just DC films. There's other films like uh, this uh, Wonka and I believe a couple of others that were also delayed. So this is not specifically a DC delay. It's it's a whole Warner Bros. Pictures delay. So I don't buy this, you know, point about, you know, virtual, uh, visual effects uh, being the, the factor. I think this is just Discovery saying, okay, we're, we're losing a lot of money here. We're going to let the new person come in and make the decision. So put everything on hold, even if it means not taking uh, cash that would have come in uh, for the first year. So it's a bold move. It's a move that has financial implications, but uh, it's also a move that could be related to all these changes. And it makes sense to me to prevent uh, somebody from doing damage that would put a person coming in to make decisions in a position of disadvantage or uh, in a position where they cannot succeed. So. This part is smart to me. It's uh, it's a sacrifice in some way or another, but it's basically, you know, a good way to approach it and to think of that you know changes will will continue. As you may understand, there is also salaries. There is a lot of things to consider in this restructuring, and I don't think that basically they're going to keep uh, everyone and everything. I think this was this is an absor absorption from Discovery, where. They will take a lot of the infrastructure uh, to produce some of the things that Warner Media was producing, but uh, I think Warner Media as a corporate structure is essentially done. And in the next couple of months, little by little, you're going to be seeing the structural changes and personnel changes. So, right now, it's just the beginning, but I think uh, we have to see this positively. I think that 
uh, based on what I'm saying, that uh, they're going to start looking at the data now and they're going to start looking at the markets. It's your time to make noise. So this is not a time to relax or to let off the uh, of the pedal. Uh, you need to be heard, make yourself be heard like you have all along. You know, this this strength that you have as a marketing force uh, has to continue. You have to keep basically demanding what you need as a, as a consumer. And we'll see what happens in the future. I think, you know, there is room for many different strategies. You know, the strategy that makes most sense to me when it comes to DC is, uh, you know, you, you have to go with the heavy hitters. You have to go with what makes you the most money. You cannot have a divided fan base. You cannot have a message in which you do not have um, everyone's support essentially you need to follow through um, something that's attractive but you cannot basically go um, guessing you know that something will not work you need to get everyone on board you need to basically use the characters that makes the most uh, get the most attention that people have the most support from people you need all your fans all hands on deck uh, helping you out you need to uh, you know realize that the thing that can make you the most uh, money and the most noise is a return of the Snyderverse uh, and a complement of that can be, you know, a Snyderverse as, as a shared universe with all these side projects, some of them on HBO Max, similar to what uh, Disney is doing. Um, but also you can have, uh, you know, standoff uh, self-contained series like Mad Reeves' Batman or, uh, you know, whatever, you know, stylish, you know, self-defined, you know, things that don't need a bigger universe can be. So you combine those two and you start forgetting about these sort of theatrical cheap releases like Shazam and Harley Quinn, you know, those things at best could be for, for, for a streaming service, but you know, you really need to come packing a punch and you need everyone's help. So this, this divided fan base does not work. They need to understand that they need to give people what they, you know, what they want to see to, to be successful. And I think if they're smart enough, they will be able to figure it out. But on, on, until then we have to keep basically trying to make our voices be heard like we have all along. Uh, if there are articles out there trying to shut you down, it's for a reason. Uh, so, so keep at it. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. That being said, that's all I have for today. So we will touch base again sometime later on when I discuss uh, perhaps this strategy more in detail in a future episode. Uh, but for now, that's all I got. Thank you guys and talk to you soon. Bye.